What do you get when you cross a historic building with one of the fastest growing whiskey entrepreneurs in Cleveland? Well, you get a preservation of great history with a promise of continued good spirits. Now that's something we can all drink to. So join us today as we talk with Tom Licks, founder and CEO of Cleveland Whiskey, on this episode of History and Relics. Currently operating out of 2,600 square feet of space inside a manufacturing center on East 25th Street in the heart of downtown Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland Whiskey is making a great name for itself by making great whiskey every day. In fact, they've won over 80 medals globally, including 36 gold, double gold, platinum, innovator of the year, and best of show. In March of 2015, they even caught the eye of the White House when then-President Barack Obama paid a visit to the prized distillery. There's a new and quicker way to make whiskey. To make better whiskey. I'm not, uh, I'm not sampling any before the speech. But I may take a bottle home with me. We got a chance to sit down and talk exclusively with Cleveland Whiskey's founder and CEO, Tom Licks, to have him tell us in his own words about his award-winning brand of whiskey as well as his expansion plans to the former Consolidated Fruit Auction Company building, built in 1911, which sits along the east bank of the Cuyahoga River. So let's kick things off. How did you get started in the whiskey business? Um, uh, there were sort of a couple of things. I mean, uh, years ago when I was in the Navy, uh, I learned distilling. Essentially, I learned how to make fresh water out of salt water. I went to distilling school. And then I got stationed on this old destroyer, uh, it was about to be decommissioned. It was a reserve ship. Most of the chief petty officers ran it day to day. My first day on board that ship, a chief took me aside, uh, led me through some hatches, went through a, uh, uh, a hatch on the deck down into the space. And in that space, he was fermenting fruit juice from the galley, it's sort of a sugared Kool-Aid. And, uh, and he was making what he called hooch for our ship and all the surrounding ships. So I was his apprentice. Uh, and all you really need to make uh, alcohol is a, ferm you know, a fermentation of something, some sugar source, and you need some heat to do that. Well, we had steam lines going throughout the ship, so you had a heat source. He drilled a hole in one of those, and we had a heat source. And then you need a cooling source to turn that vapor back into a liquid, and there are salt water uh, lines running throughout the ship for cooling purposes, firefighting, etc. He drilled a hole in one of those, and they had a cooling source, and, and he had a little... Uh, a uh, homemade still down on that ship, and that's how I learned about it. Um, I didn't do anything with it for years, but not that long ago, I read an article about uh, the growing middle class in China. And it talked about how uh, people in the middle class, as they entered it, they looked for and bought affordable luxuries. And as I thought about it more, I thought, you know, it's not just affordable luxuries, it's conspicuous affordable luxuries, things they can share with their friends. So I did a little more research and I noticed as the middle class was ticking up in places like China and India and Africa and South America and really around the world, uh, consumption of bourbon and import, you know, imported uh, scotch and imported bourbon, a great conspicuous affordable luxury, that was going up. And this is an industry that, you know, it, it's, a, it's where it takes a lot of time to make a product. And I thought there's got to be a better way to do that. There'd be a market opportunity. And uh, uh, long story short, I got into this business uh, with some technology. And we are a technology business. We're, you know, we respect the craft and there's a little bit of craft distillery to us. But mainly we're a technology company and we've got some interesting proprietary technology that we use to make what we do here today. Oh, that's awesome. Tell us about one of your passions that explains how or why you got into this business. Well, so I'm, uh, 
you know, if I, if I had a better attention span, I'd be a chemist. So I, I really love chemistry. It's just okay. not meant for me. But um, when I read the article and, and sort of had that light go off in my head about consumption of imported spirits around the world, I thought, here's an industry that uh, the technology itself hasn't changed in decades, in generations it hasn't changed. And I okay. thought, there's really got to be a better way to this. So I looked at all the patent files, I gathered whatever information I could, uh, you know, I, I read just about everything I could possibly find, and then I'm an experimenter, so I started experimenting in my basement. Wow. And because I'm not a real chemist, I made some mistakes. I'm a social scientist, uh, I, I have a doctorate in business, so I understand how to do research, but I went down some avenues that really don't make any sense if you were a chemist. And, uh, uh, as some might say, I stumbled upon some of the answers that way and kept pursuing them and making them better and refining them and that's really where we got to where we are. Now, uh, to illustrate that point a little bit more, I'll tell you a little quick little story about when I was a young kid. I don't know if I was uh, um, you know, 10 years old or something or, or 9 years old. I remember one Christmas, I got a chemistry set for Christmas. And uh, the same year, I got a little model rocket ship. It was made out of galvanized metal. It was heavy. It was meant to sit on a shelf. It wasn't meant to fly. But I'm a 10-year-old boy with a chemistry set and a rocket ship, so naturally, I wanted to make rocket fuel. That was my objective. And one day, my parents left me at home. They took the siblings out. That was a big mistake. I was the oldest of five. And once they left, I said, OK, now this is my opportunity to make rocket fuel. So. I started digging around, I pulled down pots and pans, I'm bringing my chemistry set, everything down in the basement, but I needed a pot that had a lid on it, because if I made rocket fuel, I was gonna have to contain it. So I'm looking around the kitchen some more, finally I see on this top shelf, this big pot with a lid on it. And I said, oh, I'll get that. But I was small enough yet, I had to bring a chair over to the counter to get up on the counter. Then I pulled the chair up on top of the counter, got up there, got this pot, took it downstairs, and I started mixing all these chemicals together. Now, also in this old house we lived in, it had a gas hot water heater that would occasionally, well, not occasionally, frequently flame out and you'd have to relight it. So there was a box of wooden matches right next to the heater as well. So now I'm a 10 year old boy with a chemistry set, a rocket ship and a box of wooden matches. So I'm mixing everything up, I'm throwing matches in, nothing's really working. I probably used up every, every chemical in the chemistry set that I had, and chemistry sets back then were different. I mean, I remember my chemistry set came with a bottle of mercury. All the kids that got chemistry sets that year, we came into school after Christmas with little dark spots on our fingers because we were all rolling mercury around on the table because it jiggles and moves, and, and, uh, and that's what you did with mercury. But. Um, so, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'll, I'll throw one another thing. So I was getting laundry detergent, bottles of cleaner, everything else from under the sinks in the basement, out of a closet. And finally, at one point, I poured something in, and I don't even remember what it was, but I poured something in that pot, and I started getting this ferocious bubbling, big, fat, white bubbles, a smoke was coming off of it, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I invented rocket fuel. So I slapped the lid on this pot. Now. Turns out that that pot was a pressure cooker. My mom had seen a little frac uh, fracture in the lid, so she knew it wasn't safe. That's why she had put it out of reach of everybody. And um, uh, I slapped the lid on that, pat, uh, on that pot. I ran to the other side of the basement. I'm underneath the sink getting more of whatever I had just thrown in there because I wanted to keep the reaction going. Yeah. And I woke up in a hospital room. It turns out that the lid did fracture. There was a small explosion. I was lucky I didn't get hit by the shrapnel because I was under the sink. But the hot water heater did. There was some sort of small explosion, a concussive, for concussive force. I was knocked out and unconscious. I bur nearly burned down the family home. Needless to say, I lost my chemistry set privileges for a couple of years. But, <laughs> but that's sort of, so those are all the pieces. That's a longer answer than you wanted, but that's some of the pieces that went into why I'm in this business today. How did you come about the name Cleveland Whiskey? Well, I was in Cleveland, <laughs> I think. You know, well, it's, it's actually funny because I was a transplant. I'm, I'm an immigrant to Cleveland. Uh -huh. uh, out of Boston, primarily the East Coast, my mom was born and raised here. Uh, had a chance to come out and care for her in her last couple of years. And, and, and uh, while I was here, I learned I really fell in love with Cleveland. I think it's a great city, lots of opportunity. Um, 
but being new here, I wasn't sure how the name Cleveland was going to work on my bottle. So we commissioned a study, an outside research firm, to do research on the name Cleveland, compared it to a series of other names, uh, which I won't tell you because we may still use them at some point. But, but we looked at, at what would it do to a bottle if we put Cleveland on the name. And we did, um, I don't know how many hundred different interviews, but the Cleveland name came out best. Not just well, but it came out tested best against all the other ones that we tested. And people said it stood for something that was hardworking, entrepreneurial. Um, uh, and, and I think most importantly, they said it was edgy. And I thought, well, that's, that's good. I like that. Cleveland edgy. And this was pre- LeBron James, pre-gay games, pre-Republican convention, all the things that might have brought notoriety to the city, this is what people around the city thought of. Less so in the city itself, but around the country, they said, gee, Cleveland really has some positive correlations here. So we, uh, once I put Cleveland whiskey on the bottle and on the company name, I, I knew I was going to stay here, and I have. Can you explain the special aging process you have and how it saves time? I mean, it does take less time. It's really a method to extract flavor out of the woods. Now, in a whiskey, 60 to 80% of the flavor comes from the wood itself. But it's a slow, and all of the color, so, but it's a slow process, and, and it relies on sort of mother nature to sort of determine how long it takes. You put spirits in a barrel. Every day you've got a 24-hour temperature cycle. That temperature cycle causes a slight pressure, pressure change inside the barrel that's moving the alcohol in and out of the pore structure of the wood. Pretty simple process. Add some flavors, take some other ones away. Add some flavors, take some other, other ones away. And in four, six, eight, 10, 12 years, you might have what you want. But all you're doing is moving alcohol in and out of the pore structure of the wood. Well, now think about a, a sponge in a bucket of water. You put it down there and you squeeze it, it's drying your hand. You let it go, the water rushes into the pore structure. Squeeze it, dry, let it go, it opens right up. Well, I can do the same thing using pressure variations and wood to drive the alcohol deeply into the pore structure of the wood and then push it back out. So I'm using technology to do that. There's a couple of other things that, that I won't go into, but, but that's the essence of what we do. And what it does is, yes, we can do things quicker, which means I can research and develop and new products a whole lot faster. It also means that I can use woods other than oak. Now, we all use oak barrels, every other whiskey in the world. It's aged in oak, whether by law or by practice or by necessity. You put things in an oak barrel, which was designed simply as a storage and transportation container. You put liquid in it and it holds it. I'm sure that over the hundreds of years we've been using barrels, people built barrels out of black walnut or pine trees or whatever other woods that were common, but the problem is most of them leak like a sieve. So here you have this storage container that, that now gives all the flavor to a whiskey. Well, what about the other woods? What if we could use them? Woods like black cherry and apple and hickory and sugar maple, all of those woods have some unique and interesting flavors but again, you can't build barrels out of them. Well, with our system, I can put those woods along with spirits in a pressure capable stainless steel vessel, apply pressure variations, pressure, vacuum, pressure, vacuum, drive that alcohol in and out and get the flavors from those woods that otherwise you can't do. And, and you, you, you sort of pose the question as, you claim you have a technology. Well, it, it's something we have in the market today and we've done uh, thousands of blind taste tests against other products that are done in a very traditional manner and we do very very well in blind tasting competitions we've won a hundred different medals uh, many of them golds and double golds and platinums and best in shows when people aren't paying attention to the age it doesn't matter it's all about the flavor age is irrelevant age is simply the metric by which we got used to thinking about gee an older whiskey is better Almost like how in cars today, we still talk about horsepower because we transitioned from, you know, did you have one horse or two horse or four horses pulling your wagon? And we kept that with, with automobile engines, even though it really doesn't matter anymore. Well, age is the same thing. Age really is irrelevant if you're applying some of the newer technologies. Can you tell us about your first year of production and your growth prospects for the future? 
Uh, well, we launched, uh, we shipped our first bottles in March of 2013. I can't remember how many bottles we shipped. It seemed like a lot at the time. It's dwarfed by what we do now. Uh, and, uh, and it will continue to get dwarfed. Every year we do better. 2019 was our first profitable year. Uh, 2020, despite the pandemic, was our second profitable year. 2021 will undoubtedly be our third profitable year, and we keep growing and growing our revenues. Um, so, you know, it gets boring if we talk about numbers in the context of a video, but I, I think, we, you know, we've done pretty well. We have distribution in 16 states. Uh, until sort of the tariff craziness went into effect, we were doing business in about five countries, and I expect that those will change again and we'll be doing business overseas before we know it. Do you have a personal favorite? They're all my babies. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a relatively new one that we produce. It's called uh, uh, our Wheat Penny Bourbon. Uh, we actually take the time to drill a little hole in the, top, in the stopper and put a wheat sheave penny in there. They stopped making wheat sheave pennies in 1958. And it started with a collection of pennies that I started with a little, as a little kid because my mom always told me it was good luck to pick up a penny. And I've been saving them like many other kids did of my generation. Uh, you know, in, in buckets and mayonnaise jars and everything else for years. And now finally I'm getting to use my pennies by putting one on the top, gluing it in on the top of every bottle of wheat penny that we do. It's a weeded bourbon. It's finished with black cherry wood. Uh, it's really good. What are some of the expansion plans you have for Cleveland Whiskey? So we're actually in the middle of, we've locked up a building on the flats. Uh, it's a historic building. Um, uh, which is now getting sort of the historical designation. It was just designated a Cleveland landmark. We just got approved the, by the Ohio Historical Society. Um, it's, it's an interesting building. It's much larger than this. Uh, we, our production space right now is about 2,600 square feet. Uh, this building uh, is a total of about 26,000 square feet. So it's much, much larger. We'll be able to increase our production uh, 20 times in that new building. Uh, but it's a total rehab. It's, uh, it's a building that was built in 1910 or 1911. It was originally designed as a building. Uh, it's long and uh, narrow. And on one side, uh, there were two sets of railroad tracks and fruit cars from California would arrive with fresh produce or fresh fruit, uh, ice cars, and they would unload on one side of the building. And on the other side, there's a whole bunch of bay doors where really horse and wagons as well as early vehicles would come and pick up and distribute and that was the center of uh, uh, fruit distribution in the city of Cleveland back in the early 1900s up until uh, you know certainly through the 20s. Uh, it was considered an innovative building at the time which I, I, I sort of like that concept of we're going into a building that was once considered an innovation in and of itself and we're bringing all of our innovation into that building and, and again back in the sort of quote food business so to speak. How did you come about finding the Consolidated Fruit Auction Company building that you're moving into? We had lots of help and we looked and uh, looked at dozens of different buildings I and mean, it was important for us to stay in Cleveland. We are Cleveland whiskey after all. Um, and it just needed the right space. I wanted it to have some character. I wanted it to be in the right place. I wanted it to be an area where people would enjoy coming. It's right on the river. Uh, great location, wonderful views of the city, great windows. I mean, again, there's a lot of work that has to be done and it's a major project for us, but uh, I think when it's done, it's gonna be very exciting. Do your plans for the building include major changes to the exterior? No, I think it's going to be a lot closer to what it originally was. So okay. we're going to add uh, where things are bricked in. I, I hope to take them out and put it back into much more of a historical perspective. I mean, oh, wow. you know, some of them will operate different, uh, but I, I want to have it uh, contemporized and yet at the same time, uh, you know, really keeping the historical character of the building. Okay. So, you know, in a building that's that old, obviously there have been a lot of changes to it over time. I think it was originally one size. It's been added to twice in the early, you know, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but it all, you know, it's a good, long, continuous space for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we won't have uh, horse-drawn wagons coming in. We've got to change the spacing of things. Trucks are a little bit higher now. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be the best of both worlds. Okay. Are there plans for a restaurant or bar here as well? Yes. Yeah, it, it really makes sense for us to, we, 
even here in the small space we're in, we're a destination for people to come to. And, uh, you know, I think having that restaurant, having a bar there, really a couple of different bars, I think will make sense for us. Uh, it's a way for, yeah, it's a, it's a way for us to feature our products and demonstrate them in cocktails as well. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. We haven't decided yet what the nature of that restaurant will be, and, uh, uh, but uh, I think whatever it is, it's going to fit nicely. So, What things are next on the agenda? Well, technically, we've already broken ground, so, you know, we had to do some of the repairs to the building just to keep it safe and secure, make some repairs on the roof and, you know, protect some windows and things like that that were there. So it's in progress already. We haven't selected a general contractor yet, but we will. Um, you know, it's, it's a, for anybody who's gone through this, well, anybody who's even gone through a, a home renovation, you know how long it can take to to get the contractors, to get the work done, and I want to do this right. Um, it's also something we have to fund. So, you know, we're talking to banks, uh, we're, you know, talking to our current investors, we're talking to uh, our fans, uh, and raising the money for this project as well. In 2019, Cleveland Whiskey hosted former boxer Boom Boom Mancini in his private label bourbon. Are there any future plans to involve other sports or local celebrities in promotions? Yeah, well, let me explain that. When we make that Boom Boom bourbon for him, okay. so it's, uh, it's what we would call a private label for him. So he was there promoting his bourbon, which we make. So it's a win-win okay. for us. Right. Um, uh, but to the extent that we do things like that, certainly we'd have them, we'd have them in and part of what we did. That was just sort of a, uh, uh, it, it was a great event for us, but it, it, in some ways it's part of the routine of what we do. What do you want people to remember about Cleveland Whiskey after they visit for the first time? Well, I mean, I want them to have a good experience. I want them to have a pleasant experience. I want them to pay, independent of whatever level they are. You know, are they an experienced whiskey drinker? Uh, are they someone who's really never tried it? Somebody who comes in with a spouse or a friend and says, oh, I don't even like whiskey. Uh, you know, I want everybody to leave with a, a good experience and feel like they were taken care of, that they taste some interesting, delicious products. Um, yeah, I just, I, I just want them to have a good time. I want them to leave and tell their friends and say, gee, we went to Cleveland Whiskey. That was a great event to go to. And, uh, and I'm going to go to a liquor store and buy some more of their bottles. There you go. That's what I want. There you go. Yeah. In a few words, describe your mission statement. You know, I, I've had a lot of different jobs in my career. And, and I, I can say unequivocally, unequivocally that, uh, you know, this is sort of my most fun profession. You know, I get antsy during the course of a weekend if I don't come in and look in on things or just, you know, uh, take a walk through the new space or come over here. Uh, there are sounds to the distillery when I walk in in the morning, sounds and smells that just sort of bring a smile to my face as I walk in and I know things are working and running and we're making good whiskey. You know, it's, it's interesting because we, we have a very simple mission statement or a very basic mission statement. It's, it's every day make good whiskey and do the right thing. So it's, it's an easy one to remember. It's easy one for us to live, well, not always easy to live up to, but we work very hard at it. Um, during the pandemic, for instance, we did, uh, uh, we partnered with the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we did hand and sanitizer for their 51,000 frontline healthcare workers. We made it for police stations, fire stations, emergency medical services distributed it to nursing homes around the entire Cleveland metro area. We never charged a dime for any of it. That was part of the do the right thing. But in the meantime, every day we're here making good whiskey. And because of the technology, what we make today is better than what we made six months ago. And that's better than what we made a few years before then, because we can keep making little changes to say, ah, I can get a little more of this flavor, a little more of that. I can take away some of this. So we're constantly experimenting. You know, I talked about being an amateur chemist and part of my interest in that is the ability to experiment. And the beauty of this, I mean, unlike a traditional distillery, where if you want to run experiments, you've got to make something, you put it in a barrel, maybe two years in, it might be worth tasting. You say, okay, that's promising, let's try it again. You tried it four years and say, okay, 
that's still pretty good. Try it again at five, at six. Maybe you've got something 80 years old and you say, finally, of the hundreds of barrels you produce, you know, that one's pretty good. Let's make some more of it. And you've got to go back eight years in time. Here, every week, I'm trying new things. We're making it. We're testing it. We can put them in front of consumer panels and focus groups, get reaction from people, put it in front of professional tasters and my own staff and say, yes, this is working. This isn't working. Sometimes it's a brand new product. Sometimes it's, it's a concept that we put on a shelf and we say, we'll, we'll try it. We'll make it commercially later. And sometimes we say, you know, that's not any good. We'll just discard it. And, uh, and we do plenty of that as well. And now let's take a few moments to tell you about the history of the Consolidated Fruit Auction Company building and future home of Cleveland Whiskey. William E. Bigelow is credited with having handled the first train carload shipment of oranges from California in the 1880s when he was the head of the Consolidated Fruit Exchange of Cleveland, Ohio. He later founded the Consolidated Fruit Auction Company in 1891. The original registered address of the business was the 1416 Williamson Building in downtown Cleveland, now the site of the current BP or Huntington Bank Building at 200 Public Square. The company originally operated out of Cleveland's Wholesale Food and Public Market District, which is now the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Being a dominant wholesale outlet for fruits and produce, the company quickly outgrew its surroundings. The company then struck a deal with the cities of Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, and the St. Louis Railways to build a standalone building steps away from the rail line in the valley by the Cuyahoga River. The actual site sat upon 80 acres located at 601 Stones Levee Road on the east bank of the Cuyahoga River and below the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge, all near downtown Cleveland. The structure, which is about 44 feet wide and nearly 500 feet long, was built in 1911 by Henry G. Slatmeyer & Son Construction Company, with expansions built in 1915 and again in 1922 for a total square footage of over 25,000 feet. The building once had auction and display rooms along with a large warehouse with multiple bay doors which allowed for up to 24 boxcars to be unloaded simultaneously. Nightly, trains would arrive at the river side of the building and the rail cars would be parked up to a pair of railroad ties for unloading. The next morning, an auction would be held with other wholesalers, supermarkets, restaurants, and fancy fruit vendors who got first priority. Next, other fruit peddlers would group up to buy what was left. The produce rail cars were painted yellow to set them apart from the normal red cars. It wasn't until the 1950s that refrigerated boxcars were commonplace. In the meantime, produce would be transported by rail car with up to three to four tons of ice to keep the cars cool. The railroad built icing stations in between large cities where cars would be topped off with more ice as they traveled to the next destination. Bigelow retired to Beverly Hills, California in 1920 and later invested heavily in real estate. He was one of the organizers of the group that fought for the rezoning of Wilshire Boulevard from residential to commercial. The company he founded stayed in operation until 1929 when it moved to the Northern Ohio Food Terminal on 4.6 acres from East 37th Street to East 40th Street between Woodland and Orange Avenues in Cleveland. The company later dissolved on October 1, 1932. The building on Stones Levee Road then became home to a canned goods supplier that operated much in the same way as the Consolidated Fruit Company did until the 1960s. From there, Malcolm Plumbing Fixtures and Supply Company came in in the 1980s and painted its name on the building's exterior. The once thriving building that brought innovation to the food industry in Cleveland is getting ready for a whole new lease on life through Tom Licks and Cleveland Whiskey. Cleveland Whiskey is reviving and rebuilding a little piece of Cleveland's history. Their innovative and technological advances will certainly serve up a new and exciting spirit for Cleveland's future. Now let's take a quick tour of the site as it stands today, starting with Tom's christening of the building on Friday, July 17th of 2020. From there, we'll look around the site 
and end with a future rendition and drawing of the future Cleveland Whiskey. Thank you to Tom Licks, Rebecca Harmon, and everyone at Cleveland Whiskey for allowing us this great opportunity. We look forward to working with you again soon. And if you'd like to know more about Cleveland Whiskey, check out their Facebook page or website at www.clevelandwhiskey.com. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. It costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. So until next time, everyone, this one's history. <laughs>